Chapter Nine, Part Two of Queen Victoria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Queen Victoria by Giles Lytton Strachey. Chapter Nine, Part Two. Three. And so, after the toils and tempests of the day, a long evening followed, mild, serene, and lighted with a golden glory. For an unexampled atmosphere of success and adoration invested the last period of Victoria's life. Her triumph was the summary, the crown of a greater triumph, the culminating prosperity of a nation. The solid splendor of the decade between Victoria's two jubilees can hardly be paralleled in the annals of England. The sage counsels of Lord Salisbury seem to bring with them not only wealth and power, but security, and the country settled down with calm assurance to the enjoyment of an established grandeur. And, it was only natural, Victoria settled down too, for she was a part of the establishment, an essential part, as it seemed, a fixture, a magnificent, immovable sideboard in the huge saloon of state. Without her, the heaped-up banquet of 1890 would have lost its distinctive quality. The comfortable order of the substantial, unambiguous dishes, with their background of weighty glamour, half out of sight. Her own existence came to harmonize more and more with what was around her. Gradually, imperceptibly, Albert receded. It was not that he was forgotten, that would have been impossible, but that the void created by his absence grew less agonizing, and even, at last, less obvious. At last Victoria found it possible to regret the bad weather without immediately reflecting that her dear Albert always said we could not alter it, but must leave it as it was. She could even enjoy a good breakfast without considering how dear Albert would have liked the buttered eggs. And as that figure slowly faded, its place was taken inevitably by Victoria's own. Her being, revolving for so many years round an external object, now changed its motion and found its center in itself. It had to be so. Her domestic position, the pressure of her public work, her indomitable sense of duty made anything else impossible. Her egotism proclaimed its rights. Her age increased still further the surrounding deference, and her force of character, emerging at length in all its plenitude, imposed absolutely upon its environment by the conscious effort of an imperious will. Little by little it was noticed that the outward vestiges of Albert's posthumous domination grew less complete. At court the stringency of mourning was relaxed. As the Queen drove through the park in her open carriage with her Highlanders behind her, nursery maids canvassed eagerly the growing patch of violet velvet in the bonnet with its jet appurtenances on the small bowing head. It was in her family that Victoria's ascendancy reached its highest point. All her offspring were married. The number of her descendants rapidly increased. There were many marriages in the third generation, and no fewer than thirty-seven of her great-grandchildren were living at the time of her death. A picture of the period displays the royal family collected together in one of the great rooms at Windsor, a crowded company of more than fifty persons, with the imperial matriarch in their midst. Over them all she ruled with a most potent sway. The small concerns of the youngest aroused her passionate interest and the oldest she treated as if they were children still. The Prince of Wales, in particular, stood in tremendous awe of his mother. She had steadily refused to allow him the slightest participation in the business of government, and he had occupied himself in other ways. Nor could it be denied that he enjoyed himself, out of her sight. But in that redoubtable presence his abounding manhood suffered a miserable eclipse. Once at Osborne, when, owing to no fault of his, he was too late for a dinner party, he was observed standing behind a pillar and wiping the sweat from his forehead, trying to nerve himself to go up to the Queen. When at last he did so, she gave him a stiff nod, 
whereupon he vanished immediately behind another pillar and remained there until the party broke up. At the time of this incident, the Prince of Wales was over fifty years of age. It was inevitable that the Queen's domestic activities should occasionally trench upon the domain of high diplomacy, and this was especially the case when the interests of her eldest daughter, the Crown Princess of Prussia, were at stake. The Crown Prince held liberal opinions. He was much influenced by his wife, and both were detested by Bismarck, who declared with scurrilous emphasis that the English woman and her mother were a menace to the Prussian state. The feud was still further intensified when, on the death of the old emperor, 1888, the crown prince succeeded to the throne. A family entanglement brought on a violent crisis. One of the daughters of the new empress had become betrothed to Prince Alexander of Battenberg, who had lately been ejected from the throne of Bulgaria, owing to the hostility of the Tsar. Victoria, as well as the empress, highly approved of the match. Of the two brothers of Prince Alexander, the elder had married another of her granddaughters, and the younger was the husband of her daughter, the Princess Beatrice. She was devoted to the handsome young man, and she was delighted by the prospect of the third brother, on the whole the handsomest, she thought, of the three, also becoming a member of her family. Unfortunately, however, Bismarck was opposed to the scheme. He perceived that the marriage would endanger the friendship between Germany and Russia, which was vital to his foreign policy, and he announced that it must not take place. A fierce struggle between the Empress and the Chancellor followed. Victoria, whose hatred of her daughter's enemy was unbounded, came over to Charlottenburg to join in the fray. Bismarck, over his pipe and lager, snorted out his alarm. The Queen of England's object, he said, was clearly political. She wished to estrange Germany and Russia, and very likely she would have her way. In family matters, he added, she is not used to contradiction. She would bring the parson with her in her travelling bag and the bridegroom in her trunk, and the marriage would come off on the spot. But the man of blood and iron was not to be thwarted so easily, and he asked for a private interview with the Queen. The details of their conversation are unknown, but it is certain that in the course of it Victoria was forced to realize the meaning of resistance to that formidable personage, and that she promised to use all her influence to prevent the marriage. The engagement was broken off, and in the following year Prince Alexander of Battenberg united himself to Fräulein Leusinger, an actress at the court theatre of Darmstadt. But such painful incidents were rare. Victoria was growing very old, with no Albert to guide her, with no Beaconsfield to inflame her. She was willing enough to abandon the dangerous questions of diplomacy to the wisdom of Lord Salisbury, and to concentrate her energies upon objects which touched her more nearly, and over which she could exercise an undisputed control. Her home, her court, the monuments at Balmoral, the livestock at Windsor, the organization of her engagements, the supervision of the multitudinous details of her daily routine. Such matters played now an even greater part in her existence than before. Her life passed in an extraordinary exactitude. Every moment of her day was mapped out beforehand. The succession of her engagements was immutably fixed. The dates of her journeys, to Osborne, to Balmoral, to the south of France, to Windsor, to London, were hardly altered from year to year. She demanded from those who surrounded her a rigid precision in details, and she was preternaturally quick in detecting the slightest deviation from the rules which she had laid down. Such was the irresistible potency of her personality that anything but the most implicit obedience to her wishes was felt to be impossible. But sometimes somebody was unpunctual, and unpunctuality was one of the most heinous of sins. Then her displeasure, her dreadful displeasure, became all too visible. At such moments there seemed nothing surprising in her having been the daughter of a martinet. But these storms, unnerving as they were while they lasted, were quickly over, and they grew more and more exceptional. 
with a return of happiness, a gentle benignity flowed from the aged queen. Her smile, once so rare a visitant to those saddened features, flitted over them with an easy alacrity. The blue eyes beamed. The whole face, starting suddenly from its pendulous expressionlessness, brightened and softened, and cast over those who watched it an unforgettable charm. For in her last years there was a fascination in Victoria's amiability which had been lacking even from the vivid impulse of her youth. Over all who approached her, or very nearly all, she threw a peculiar spell. Her grandchildren adored her. Her ladies waited upon her with a reverential love. The honor of serving her obliterated a thousand inconveniences. The monotony of a court existence, the fatigue of standing, the necessity for a superhuman attentiveness to the minutiae of time and space. As one did one's wonderful duty, one could forget that one's legs were aching from the infinitude of the passages at Windsor, or that one's bare arms were turning blue in the Balmoral cold. What above all seemed to make such service delightful was the detailed interest which the Queen took in the circumstances of those around her. Her absorbing passion for the comfortable commonplaces, the small crises, the recurrent sentimentalities of domestic life constantly demanded wider fields for its activity. The sphere of her own family, vast as it was, was not enough. She became the eager confidant of the household affairs of her ladies. Her sympathies reached out to the palace domestics. Even the housemaids and scullions, so it appeared, were the objects of her searching inquiries, and of her heartfelt solicitude when their lovers were ordered to a foreign station, or their aunts suffered from an attack of rheumatism which was more than usually acute. Nevertheless, the due distinctions of rank were immaculately preserved. The Queen's mere presence was enough to ensure that, but in addition, the dominion of court etiquette was paramount. For that elaborate code, which had kept Lord Melbourne stiff upon the sofa and ranged the other guests in silence about the round table, according to the order of precedence, was as punctiliously enforced as ever. Every evening after dinner, the hearth-rug, sacred to royalty, loomed before the profane in inaccessible glory or, on one or two terrific occasions, actually lured them magnetically forward to the very edge of the abyss. The queen at the fitting moment moved towards her guests. One after the other they were led up to her, and while dialogue followed dialogue in constraint and embarrassment, the rest of the assembly stood still without a word. Only in one particular was the severity of the etiquette allowed to lapse. Throughout the greater part of the reign, the rule that ministers must stand during their audiences with the Queen had been absolute. When Lord Derby, the Prime Minister, had an audience of Her Majesty after a serious illness, he mentioned it afterwards as a proof of the royal favour that the Queen had remarked, How sorry she was she could not ask him to be seated! Subsequently, Disraeli, after an attack of gout and in a moment of extreme expansion on the part of Victoria, had been offered a chair, but he had thought it wise humbly to decline the privilege. In her later years, however, the Queen invariably asked Mr. Gladstone and Lord Salisbury to sit down. Sometimes the solemnity of the evening was diversified by a concert, an opera, or even a play. One of the most marked indications of Victoria's enfranchisement from the thraldom of widowhood had been her resumption, after an interval of thirty years, of the custom of commanding dramatic companies from London to perform before the court at Windsor. On such occasions her spirits rose high. She loved acting, she loved a good plot, above all she loved a farce. Engrossed by everything that passed upon the stage, she would follow with childlike innocence the unwinding of the story, or she would assume an air of knowing superiority, and exclaim in triumph, There! You didn't expect that, did you? when the denouement came. Her sense of humor was of a vigorous, though primitive, kind.
she had been one of the very few persons who had always been able to appreciate the prince consort's jokes and when those were cracked no more she could still roar with laughter in the privacy of her household over some small piece of fun some oddity of an ambassador or some ignorant minister's faux pas when the jest grew subtle she was less pleased but if it approached the confines of the indecorous the danger was serious to take a liberty called down at once her majesty's most crushing disapprobation and to say something improper was to take the greatest liberty of all then the royal lips sank down at the corners the royal eyes stared in astonished protrusion and in fact the royal countenance became inauspicious in the highest degree the transgressor shuddered into silence while the awful we are not amused annihilated the dinner-table afterwards in her private entourage the queen would observe that the person in question was she very much feared not discreet it was a verdict from which there was no appeal in general her aesthetic tastes had remained unchanged since the days of mendelssohn lancer and laplache she still delighted in the roulade of italian opera she still demanded a high standard in the execution of a pianoforte duet her views on painting were decided sir edwin she declared was perfect she was much impressed by lord leighton's manners and she profoundly distrusted mr watts from time to time she ordered engraved portraits to be taken of members of the royal family on these occasions she would have the first proofs submitted to her and having inspected them with minute particularity she would point out their mistakes to the artists indicating at the same time how they might be corrected the artists invariably discovered that her majesty's suggestions were of the highest value in literature her interests were more restricted she was devoted to lord tennyson and as the prince consort had admired george eliot she perused middlemarch she was disappointed there is reason to believe however that the romances of another female writer whose popularity among the humbler classes of her majesty's subjects was at one time enormous secured no less the approval of her majesty otherwise she did not read very much once however the queen's attention was drawn to a publication which it was impossible for her to ignore the greville memoirs filled with a mass of historical information of extraordinary importance but filled also with descriptions which were by no means flattering of george the fourth william the fourth and other royal persons was brought out by mr reeve victoria read the book and was appalled it was she declared a dreadful and really scandalous book and she could not say how horrified and indignant she was at greville's indiscretion indelicacy ingratitude toward friends betrayal of confidence and shameful disloyalty towards his sovereign she wrote to disraeli to tell him that in her opinion it was very important that the book should be severely censured and discredited the tone in which he speaks of royalty she added is unlike anything one sees in history even and is most reprehensible her anger was directed with almost equal vehemence against mr reeve for his having published such an abominable book and she charged sir arthur helps to convey to him her deep displeasure mr reeve however was impenitent when sir arthur told him that in the queen's opinion the book degraded royalty he replied not at all it elevates it by the contrast it offers between the present and the defunct state of affairs but this adroit defence failed to make any impression upon victoria and mr reeve when he retired from the public service did not receive the knighthood which custom entitled him to expect perhaps if the queen had known how many caustic comments upon herself mr reeve had quietly suppressed in the published memoirs she would have been almost grateful to him but in that case what would she have said of greville imagination boggles at the thought 
as for more modern essays upon the same topic her majesty it is to be feared would have characterized them as not discreet but as a rule the leisure hours of that active life were occupied with recreations of a less intangible quality than the study of literature or the appreciation of art victoria was a woman not only of vast property but of innumerable possessions she had inherited an immense quantity of furniture of ornaments of china of plate of valuable objects of every kind her purchases throughout a long life made a formidable addition to these stores and there flowed in upon her besides from every quarter of the globe a constant stream of gifts over this enormous mass she exercised an unceasing and minute supervision and the arrangement and the contemplation of it in all its details filled her with an intimate satisfaction the collecting instinct has its roots in the very depths of human nature and in the case of victoria it seemed to owe its force to two of her dominating impulses the intense sense which had always been hers of her own personality and the craving which growing with the years had become in her old age almost an obsession for fixity for solidity for the setting up of palpable barriers against the outrages of change and time when she considered the multitudinous objects which belonged to her or better still when choosing out some section of them as the fancy took her she actually savoured the vivid richness of their individual qualities she saw herself deliciously reflected from a million facets felt herself magnified miraculously over a boundless area and was well pleased that was just as it should be but then came the dismaying thought everything slips away crumbles vanishes Sev dinner services get broken even golden basins go unaccountably astray even one's self with all the recollections and experiences that make up one's being fluctuates perishes dissolves but no it could not should not be so there should be no changes and no losses nothing should ever move neither the past nor the present and she herself least of all and so the tenacious woman hoarding her valuables decreed their immortality with all the resolution of her soul she would not lose one memory or one pin she gave orders that nothing should be thrown away and nothing was there in drawer after drawer in wardrobe after wardrobe reposed the dresses of seventy years but not only the dresses the furs and the mantles and subsidiary frills and the muffs and the parasols and the bonnets all were ranged in chronological order dated and complete a great cupboard was devoted to the dolls in the china room at windsor a special table held the mugs of her childhood and her children's mugs as well mementos of the past surrounded her in serried accumulations in every room the tables were powdered thick with the photographs of relatives their portraits revealing them at all ages covered the walls their figures in solid marble rose up from pedestals or gleamed from brackets in the form of gold and silver statuettes the dead in every shape in miniatures in porcelain in enormous life-size oil paintings were perpetually about her john brown stood upon her writing-table in solid gold her favorite horses and dogs endowed with a new durability crowded round her footsteps sharp in silver gilt dominated the dinner-table boy and boz lay together among unfading flowers in bronze and it was not enough that each particle of the past should be given the stability of metal or of marble the whole collection in its arrangement no less than its entity should be immutably fixed there might be additions but there might never be alterations no chintz might change no carpet no curtain be replaced by another or if long use at last made it necessary the stuffs and patterns must be so identically reproduced that the keenest eye might not detect the difference no new picture could be hung upon the walls at windsor for those already there had been put in their places by albert whose decisions were eternal so indeed were victorious 
To ensure that they should be, the aid of the camera was called in. Every single article in the Queen's possession was photographed from several points of view. These photographs were submitted to Her Majesty, and when, after careful inspection, she had approved of them, they were placed in a series of albums richly bound. Then, opposite each photograph, an entry was made indicating the number of the article, the number of the room in which it was kept, its exact position in the room, and all its principal characteristics. The fate of every object which had undergone this process was henceforth irrevocably sealed. The whole multitude, once and for all, took up its steadfast station, and Victoria, with a gigantic volume or two of the endless catalogue always beside her to look through, to ponder upon, to expatiate over, could feel with a double contentment that the transitoriness of the world had been arrested by the amplitude of her might. Thus the collection, ever multiplying, ever encroaching upon new fields of consciousness, ever rooting itself more firmly in the depths of instinct, became one of the dominating influences of that strange existence. It was a collection not merely of things and of thoughts, but of states of mind and ways of living as well. The celebration of anniversaries grew to be an important branch of it, of birthdays and marriage days and death days, each of which demanded its appropriate feeling, which, in its turn, must be itself expressed in an appropriate outward form. And the form, of course, the ceremony of rejoicing or lamentation, was stereotyped with the rest. It was part of the collection. On a certain day, for instance, flowers must be strewn on John Brown's monument at Balmoral, and the date of the yearly departure for Scotland was fixed by that fact. Inevitably, it was around the central circumstance of death, death the final witness to human mutability, that these commemorative cravings clustered most thickly. Might not even death itself be humbled, if one could recall enough, if one asserted with a sufficiently passionate and reiterated emphasis the eternity of love? Accordingly, every bed in which Victoria slept had attached to it at the back, on the right-hand side above the pillow, a photograph of the head and shoulders of Albert as he lay dead, surmounted by a wreath of immortelle. At Balmoral, where memories came crowding so closely, the solid signs of memory appeared in surprising profusion. Obelisks, pyramids, tombs, statues, cairns, and seats of inscribed granite proclaimed Victoria's dedication to the dead. There, twice a year, on the days that followed her arrival, a solemn pilgrimage of inspection and meditation was performed. There, on August 26th, Albert's birthday, at the foot of the bronze statue of him in Highland dress, the Queen, her family, her court, her servants, and her tenantry met together, and in silence drank to the memory of the dead. In England the tokens of remembrance pullulated hardly less. Not a day passed without some addition to the multifold assemblage, a gold statuette of Ross the Piper, a life-sized marble group of Victoria and Albert in medieval costume, inscribed upon the base with the words, Allured to brighter worlds and led the way. A granite slab in the shrubbery at Osborne, informing the visitor of Waldman, the very favorite little dachshund of Queen Victoria, who brought him from Baden, April 1872, died July 11th, 1881. At Frogmore, the great mausoleum, perpetually enriched, was visited almost daily by the Queen when the court was at Windsor. But there was another, a more secret and hardly less holy shrine. The suite of rooms which Albert had occupied in the castle was kept forever shut away from the eyes of any save the most privileged. Within those precincts everything remained as it had been at the prince's death but the mysterious preoccupation of Victoria had commanded that her husband's clothing should be laid afresh each evening upon the bed, and that each evening the water should be set ready in the basin as if he were still alive, and this incredible rite was performed with scrupulous regularity for nearly forty years. Such was the inner worship, and still the flesh obeyed the spirit, 
still the daily hours of labor proclaimed victoria's consecration to duty and to the ideal of the dead yet with the years the sense of self-sacrifice faded the natural energies of that ardent being discharged themselves with satisfaction into the channel of public work the love of business which from her girlhood had been strong within her reasserted itself in all its vigor and in her old age to have been cut off from her papers and her boxes would have been not a relief but an agony to victoria thus though toiling ministers might sigh and suffer the whole process of government continued till the very end to pass before her nor was that all ancient precedent had made the validity of an enormous number of official transactions dependent upon the application of the royal sign manual and a great proportion of the queen's working hours was spent in this mechanical task nor did she show any desire to diminish it on the contrary she voluntarily resumed the duty of signing commissions in the army from which she had been set free by act of parliament and from which during the years of middle life she had abstained in no case would she countenance the proposal that she should use a stamp but at last, when the increasing pressure of business made the delays of the antiquated system intolerable, she consented that, for certain classes of documents, her oral sanction should be sufficient. Each paper was read aloud to her, and she said at the end, Approved! Often for hours at a time she would sit with Albert's bust in front of her, while the word, Approved! issued at intervals from her lips. The word came forth with a majestic sonority, for her voice now, how changed from the silvery treble of her girlhood, was a contralto full and strong. End of chapter 9, part 2